Okay, welcome everyone to another uh, author author talk author talk here in the uh, beautiful Ozarks. The first talk of the spring, I believe. Uh, even though it doesn't feel too much like spring outside today, uh, it's close, and we're going to daylight savings time this weekend. So I'm Tom Peters. I'm the dean of library services. Uh, this is like one of a long going series of author talks. There's a lot of good books coming out about the Ozarks uh, recently and in the near future, in the foreseeable future. So we've got Brooks Blevins here, who's got the, I would call that the magisterial three volume utterance about the uh, Ozarks region uh, here in attendance. But our, our uh, speaker today is Dr. Mara Cohen Ioannidis. Um, and uh, she has been studying uh, the Jews and Jewish communities in the Ozarks for over 20 years. She is a faculty member here in the English department at Missouri State University. Uh, she has degrees from Columbia University, Carnegie Mellon University, and the Spurtis Institute of Jewish Learning and Leadership on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. I don't know exactly where it is because I used to go by it all the time when I was in Chicago uh, and when I was a librarian in the great state of Illinois. Uh, she is president of the Midwest Jewish Studies Association and the newly, newly formed Ozarks Studies Association, which is having its second annual conference in May of this year down at the Shiloh Museum in Arkansas. Uh, she has written numerous articles, books, book chapters, and books, uh, including, I want to mention just two of her recent publications. One is Creating Community, The Jews of Springfield, Missouri, published last October, not that long ago, by the Greene County Historical Society. And then I should have had a prompt, but I don't. But uh, we have, the reason we're gathered here today is because her latest book, just uh, released just late last month, is Jews of Missouri, an Ornament to Israel. Uh, published by the Ozark Studies Institute, which is part of what we do here at the Missouri State at Missouri State University and here in the libraries. Um, so uh, it's an ongoing initiative of ours. And so one of the things we do is publish books about the Ozarks. We do talks, author talks. We have the Ozarks Room. We have the Ozarks Collection. We do digitization projects, all kinds of good things. But we're here today to please join me in welcoming Dr. Mara Cohen. Ioannidis. I like being on this side. Are we good? We good? We're good. Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm excited to be here. Um, so this is kind of an overlay of Jewish Missouri history um, in 30 minutes or less, which, you know, it's a whole course, not that I'm looking at anyone going, it would be a great course. Anybody here from the history department thinks it would be a great, okay. Um, but I wanna start, as I always start, with American Jewish history, um, because people forget about American Jewish history. It's not just a new thing. So the first Jews to arrive in North America were 23 Jews leaving um, Brazil because of the Inquisition, and they arrived in New Amsterdam in 1654, and it's a little bit odd to be able to count the number on, you know, almost all your hands and feet and toes. Um, but that is where it began. And this is so important for American history because these 23 Jews petitioned Governor Stuyvesant to be allowed to defend the city, the town of New Amsterdam, and he did not permit them. So they went to Dutch West India Company and requested permission. And they said, well, of course, and removed Governor Stuyvesant and gave them permission to defend the city. And this is the beginning of the idea of a separation between church and state, the inclusion of multiple religions in this country. And I wanted to bring up Chaim Solomon uh, to point out that Jews fought on both sides of the American Revolution. Chaim Solomon donated money to support the American side, the winners. Um, um, and he ended up dying in poverty because the uh, newly formed American ne government never had enough money to pay him back. But we can talk about all of that at a later date. We want to talk about it here, not now, but here. We're here now to talk about here back then. 
Um, and so we all know it all starts with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Now, we have to keep in mind, before Jefferson purchased this property, it was owned by Spain and France and Spain back and forth. And they had the Code Noir, the Black Code, that forbade anybody who was not Catholic from living in this area. Keeping in mind that at this time, Native Americans weren't really considered people. So whatever their religion was, wasn't really considered as important. I don't want you to think I'm ignoring them. The people at the time ignored them. So when Thomas Jefferson purchased this property, he disbanded the Black Code. But even before his purchase, there was an American town um, in the area, in what would become Louisiana Territory. So here we have, I kind of view the expansion of Jews across Missouri in a, a piece of geography. So we start with the Mississippi River, right? The north and south, that was the highway. And so I've put on some towns and you can see the date of their development of the Jewish community arrival in that town. So you can see that New Madrid had their first Jew in 1796 because it was an American town that was permitted to be built. It was, even though it wasn't in a, a part of um, the United States, the US kind of carved out this little pocket. And you can see how the towns kind of developed up and down the river. So the first uh, Jew was in New Madrid, and that was Ezekiel Block, part of the expansive Block family of Missouri. They were related to pretty much everyone at the beginning of the Jewish community in Missouri, one way or another. And he arrived with his slaves. So yes, there were Jewish slave holders. Um, in St. Louis, the first arrival was Joseph Phillipson, and he act was actually the first American to open a business in the new territory, and he was married into the Block family. Troy had another Block family member. Louisiana had um, two Block members, family members who were married to each other, not uncommon, cousins marrying cousins. So then when I say the expanse of Block family, they were everywhere. But how does all this fit into, again, the larger picture, right? We can't just take Missouri out of the American experience. So while it is kind of a bit old fashioned to, to name these time periods as waves, American Jewish historians do have a different definition of history movements than American historians. And I always like to point out American historians view history in a kind of violent way, right? You have colonialization and the American Revolution and the Civil War and Reconstruction. I mean, it's all really violent. Jews talk about waves. And it's more gentle, it's, it's a nicer thing. So the first wave, um, which starts with our friends in 1654, um, were Spartac Jews, Jews of Spanish background, Jews whose backgrounds were from uh, Spain and Portugal and um, they were involved in trade um, and very often lived in uh, Holland and England, and that's how they came to this country. So the first large group, although we're still not talking a whole lot of people, you can see we end the period with only 15,000 Jews. So we're not talking a lot of people, but this group is Spartac. And then there were some German Jews who are a different ethnic cultural group who come and they join these Spartac communities because the Spartac communities are established, the Spartac communities exist, and it's their way into a social experience. The second wave um, is often referred to as the German wave, which is a loose term because what we now view as German is not what was viewed as German at this point. Part of Poland was owned by various German states, okay? And this period, 1814 to 1880, is a civil upheaval 
among the German states, there's revolution and civil war, and they're trying to create a country, and it's economically scary. And the Jews came and the Christians came all together. And it, but this changes the American concept of Jew, Judaism because now there are more German Jews than Spartac Jews, and they start creating their own cultural experience. And it is mostly these this second wave community that expands into Missouri, right? Missouri is purchased, Missouri is open. And we say that knowing that of course it wasn't because there were natives here, but at the time it was open and unpopulated. And so it was a place to go. So oh, after, right, the expansion along the uh, Mississippi comes the expansion along the Missouri, right? We're expanding outward and what becomes um, Kansas City is the jumping off point to the West. It wasn't Kansas City yet, it was Westport. And you can see how it, during this period, it starts to expand West. The Jews are expanding into these towns that are along the river, because this is how we travel. Okay, and Jews were merchants. Jews were merchants because they were merchants in the old country and you come and do what you know to do. A lot of them came having left their family behind in an ex expression to expand the family business. So they would come and open a business and then they would bring their brothers, cousins, friends to open another branch of the business or expand their business. And then they would marry their cousin's sister or their friend's sister and everybody would be intermarried opening these businesses along the way. But they were in towns. Um, and it is this period where we start hearing the term Jew store. It's not in a negative. It's the expression of there's a, there's a store. It's owned by the Jew rather than it's owned by the German or the Irishman. It's the Jew store. It's a descriptor. So one of my um, favorite ads from this period is this um, by Levi Wolfstein, who opened a store in Glasgow. And I'll read it to you. His wares included a lot of fine Negro clothing worthy the attention of slaveholders. This was uh, published in 1855. Um, this, what they, this is what people did. This is just the language that we're not used to, but he is advertising to these people. He was not the first Jew in Glasgow. That honor belongs to S. Child, who opened Childs and Brothers who promised in 1846 to always undersell every store on this side of St. Louis and reminded his clients to look for the Jew store. Then came Levi Wolfstein and then Charles Oppenheimer. Um, so, and in fact, um, Charles Oppenheimer's son, Saul, was still working the family business in Glasgow in 1900. So you see these families stayed for quite a while. Um, then you have more, right? Missouri River is really important to this expansion. And we were just talking, my husband and I were just talking to a friend last night that before Kansas City, there was Westport. Westport was where, right, the traders would all come. It wasn't even a town. It was, it was a party place it's for trading season. Um, but in 1839, right around this period, Kahn and Block opened their store. And one of the uh, memoirists of the period describes them as two brothers of Polish descent who lived at Westport Landing and were noted owners of slaves until losing everything by fire and they were compelled to sell out and move elsewhere. Why of Polish descent, even though it's 1839, because again, these were probably Jews from that area that was Polish, German owned, and they define themselves as Polish. But we can see the development of this area, right, in the mid late 1850s, right, we're moving across the state. Um, Kahn and Block, who I have no idea other than the names Kahn and Block, because there are no other records than these memoirs are actually mentioned in the only history of Jewish Kansas City 
by Ethel Feynman. So I don't know if that means much more, but to me, that's very exciting. Um, Liberty was had its first Jew in 1852, and that was Mannheim Goldman. And he opened a clothing business, you're gonna hear this a lot, um, the Western Store. The town, I wanna, I love giving people population numbers because it's so hard to conceptualize. Kansas City in 1852 had a population of 800. That was a big city, come on. <laughs> it is, it's very, uh, it, that's why I like to give the numbers because it feels really odd. Um, so after the rivers, we have the development of the railroads, um, especially for coming out into the Ozarks, the railroads are so vitally important because there are no easy ways to get here otherwise. Um, but where does this put us in this concept of American Jewish history? So if you look at these numbers, right, you see this explosion between the first wave and the second wave. And then you get the third wave, which is loosely called the Russian, the Russian immigration, meaning Eastern Europeans. In the census, they're all Russians, but right, it's Poland, Russia, Lithuania, uh, Czech, Czech, all these groups are leaving and coming here. And it's huge numbers. I mean, look at the population, Jewish population of America at the end in 1910. And the Jews left. There are multiple reasons why they left. One, you were having a rise in anti-Semitism encouraged by Alexander II, who had pushed all the Jews into one region called the Pale, which was very poor. And they weren't allowed to leave. And they weren't allowed to own land, although they could work it. They weren't allowed to own it. Um, they were very restricted. And then there was a Russian rise of birth rates and life expectancy that created a crush not only in the pale, but all over Russia, right? You have too many people for the land. Couple that with the May laws, the death of Tsar Alexander, where Jews were then really constricted. They weren't allowed to leave without permission. They weren't allowed to leave their towns without permission. They weren't allowed to marry or expand or do anything. And then pogroms roll, start rolling out, promoted by the church and supported by the royalty. And so the Jews started to flee. And it sounds very simple. Well, they're gonna come and they're going to join their co-religionists in the new country, in the new world. It's not that simple because now you have a group with a different uh, cultural background and a different language um, and a different set of educational patterns the German Jews in Germany were um, basically middle class, socially, social normative with the larger German community. And so when they came here, they were educated. They could read and write in at least one language, probably two or three. They had some basic education. The Russian Jews had none of this. They were educated in Jewish subjects, but not the more secular subjects. And so this is problematic. So here is um, Southwest Missouri. Um, towns are created at railroad stops. And when you have a town, you need a store. And when there's a need for a store, there's a Jew to, to build that store. Um, so these are what I, what I have dubbed the border towns, right, all the way on the, right, all the way on the, we're already almost there, right, on the, the west edge of Missouri. And Webb uh, City was incorporated in 1876, and there were three railroad depots and a hotel. I know, three railroad depots and a hotel. It was kind of an intersection where the railroads matched up. Um, in 18, by 1885, um, Saul Goldstein and his right wife ran a store in Webb City. Um, Sarcoxy is actually uh, further east blue circle, um, is actually important to Springfield Jewish history because the first Jew there was Ludwig Ullman, who he was counted in the 1860 census 
he was a physician and he served in the Civil War for the Union. And he decided uh, to not stay there <laughs> during the Civil War actually and moved his family here to Springfield, making them the first Jewish family in Springfield as well. When he lived in Sarkoxy, the, pop, the census relates that there were 36 free whites in town. Just want to put that in perspective. Um, and there's some other really lovely uh, railroad towns to talk about. This is the Aurora Depot. Um, and I have to, I always have to pause and talk about Aurora. Um, it had a Jewish family, as most towns did. Um, that was an accepted part of town, but in modern, in totally modern Missouri Jewish history, this is the home of Glenn Fraser Miller, also known as the Casey Shooter. And that's why I put Aurora in here. There's good and there's bad. Um, so to me, a great part of, of the history of Missouri in the Jewish community is the family networks that spread across the state, the hop, skip, and jump. So I want to talk about the Levy family. Those of you who are old timers know the Levy family. Um, they owned the store on the square called uh, Levy Wolf. If you picture the square, it's on the south east side next to uh, Missouri State Building. There's the white building with the railing on top. It's right next to that. The white building with the railing on top was actually Ludwig Ullman's store, um, his pharmacy store, and right next to it was Levy Wolf. Um, oops, sorry about that. So the Levy Wolf family starts in Fidelia. Two brothers arrive, David and Simon, sometimes be, sometime between 1861 and 1864. Sedalia at this time is an army town and it's built by the Missouri Pacific Railroad. It becomes a union headquarters and the Levy brothers open a mercantile. This is neither David nor Simon. <laughs> this is their brother, Moses, who joins them in 1864. In 1868, the brothers open a branch in Arrow Rock. Um, in, and then they have a, a branch in Marshall. Um, and then they kind of pause and regroup because in 1887, um, in 1883, David dies, leaving his two brothers in charge. In 1887, Moses does two important things. One is he marries his widowed sister-in-law, which the family didn't realize. So this is a picture with one of his, you pick it, grandchildren or great nephew slash niece. So the fam, the descendants didn't realize that Moses was not the, the bi bi biological progenitor until I did some digging and they went, oh, cool, okay. Um, the other thing Moses did was he opened Levy in Springfield. At that time it was Levy. Um, when, Le when David and Simon opened their store in Sedalia, at the same time, Wolf opened his store in Sedalia. And you should not be shocked to know that David and Mr. Wolf were married to sisters. The Levy Wolf, so when uh, Moses moved here, he finally convinced his wife and the children to move here. And eventually he, uh, Sedalia didn't, wasn't quite the hub that Springfield became. So he brought his nephew, Wolf, I mean, Wolf into the family business. And so all the business closed and converged on Springfield. And the business stayed open for 100 years. And the Zarlinski family. Okay. Charles Zarlinski was born in Prussia and immigrated in 1868 when he was 18. And he went to 
Iberville Parish in Louisiana. He became a naturalized citizen there. Then he came to Missouri and settled in Kozlovstown, which was a German community right there on the far edge. Um, sometime between 18, 1878 and 1888. In 1888, he moved to Jefferson City and where he worked, he had a store, he worked as auctioneer, he worked as a manager for someone else. Um, all in all, he was considered faithful and trustworthy and genial. This is what was written about him at various times in the paper. He had a cousin or a brother, William. It's really hard to tell because the German records don't exist. So I know they're related, but we're not sure. Who was in Missouri by 1870, so probably he brought Charles with him. Um, he had also lived in Louisiana in Baton Rouge, and then he moved to Versailles. So you can see they're not that far away from each other. He lived in Versailles and he was buried in the Sedalia Cemetery. But the family history does not end there. So there's Sedalia. That's where the nearest Jewish community was. Herman Zerlinski, another cousin or brother, married in New Orleans after the Civil War. And then he and his wife divorced because of religious differences. He was Jewish, his wife was not, and they divided the children. I can't go there. I can just report what happened. They divided their children. Um, Herman moved to Sedalia for a short time and then moved to Warsaw with three children, Fanny, Gumpert, and Charles. You can see how this starts to become complicated because how many Charles Zarlinskis do you think there could be? Um, and he ran a dry, dry goods store, and then he married again and had four more children. <coughs> One of their children was Dr. Harry Zarlinski. Um, in 1875, Herman declared bankruptcy and then rebuilt himself by 1880. He was a fur dealer in town, and Harry Zarlinski became a well-known physician in the area. So where does this, again, put us in Missouri? Look at these numbers of um, Jews. Not a whole lot in relative concepts. Um, Jews have always been a small percentage. Jews in Springfield are less than 1% as a countable number, which I think is cool, we're countable. Um, but a growing number. The first congregation in the state was formed in St. Louis. Um, I wish I had the book next to me, but the image on the book, my book cover is a front street in St. Louis at the time when the first congregation was formed on front street in St. Louis. The picture, other than it's really pretty, um, there's a reason for it. So the first congregation was founded by German Jews whether they were born in Germany or born of German parentage. By 1890, there were nine congregations in the state and six actual synagogues. Um, these congregations served <coughs> between 3,000 and 5,500 Jews. Let's talk about see here. Here we go. There's the image from the cover of the book. So this is Front Street around 1835. The first congregation of Jews in the region gathered for Rosh Hashanah, the new Jewish New Year, in 1836 on this very street. I'm not sure which building, but it was on this street. Um, Louis Bomaslier, a new arrival from St. Louis, and a former member of the community of Road of Shalom in Philadelphia was one of the organizers and he was joined by the Philipsons who were also members of Rodef Shalom in Philadelphia. There were three brothers. 
Eliezer Block, told you the Blocks come back to haunt us, Abraham Weigel, who was Eliezer's son-in-law, and Nathan Abelis, who was Eliezer's son-in-law. Um, in fact, uh, Abraham Weigel was the first religious circumciser for the Jewish community of Moyo in, in the region. He traveled everywhere. They rented a room um, at Max, Max's Grocery and Restaurant on 2nd and Spruce Street. And they gathered together along with various peddlers who they had told they were going to do this with and held the first Jewish service west of the Mississippi River. This group began to meet regularly in 1839 and created a congregation that became United Hebrew Congregation in 1841. At this time, let's put these in the numbers in perspective again, people. There were no more than 50 Jews in the city, and 32 of them were members of the congregation, because there's always people who don't want to belong for whatever reason. It's just policy. But clearly, there is some, as we go through this, the history, especially in St. Louis, Road of Shalom in Philadelphia has a big power over this group and I'm not surprised right we have the Ohio River traffic and all that that merchant traffic that's going back and forth the congregation opened their first cemetery in 1840 a big time difference here why because Lewis Crafter committed suicide in 1839 and there was no place for him to be buried so his family had to have his body shipped back to Cincinnati and the local Jewish community decided that was really not acceptable and started a cemetery. Um, they owned the only Torah scroll in the city until 1845 when a second one was donated and they worshiped wherever they could find space, which is not uncommon. Someone's living room, a restaurant, a storefront, a social hall, Springfield for a long time used um, recital rooms or the big recital halls in the various piano stores in town. Isidore Bush, who was a member of the state Congress, wrote the first history of the Jews of Springfield, of uh, St. Louis, sorry, <laughs> looking around the room, Springfield, of St. Louis. And he dis described um, that one place the congregation were worshiped was a very unsuitable place, a former meeting house of colored people. So I don't know if that was the reason it was unsuitable or some other reason it was unsuitable. Um, in 1845, for the Jewish High Holy Days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there were 125 participants. A big bump up from before. This is not surprising as there were nearly 70 Jews in the city and more in the surrounding counties. Now, when they count Jews, I don't know if they're counting men only or men and women. I can't tell you. But in 1854, United Hebrew Congregation advertised in the major, major Jewish American, English, and Jew, German periodicals for rabbis. And the first rabbi was Reverend Dr. Bernard Illoui, previously of Rodef Shalom, Philadelphia. Um, and he was hired, and he was apparently a great speaker. He packed the house. Um, but after a year, he decided this was not for him, and he resigned. There is no record of why, although one could speculate for a number of reasons. St. Louis is the cusp of civilization, and if you're not willing to live on that shaky edge, that could be uncomfortable. He was a very traditional Orthodox rabbi, and this community was very German. So they were more reform, more liberal, a little bit less rigid about the rules. And maybe he found that to be a conflict. But we don't know because nobody talked about it. The first synagogue built was B'nai El. Um, and this is the building. And their, this building, I love it, was often referred to the, as the pepper box or the coffee pot, because it's an octagon shape. Um, and it cost them $6,600. So in 
So Hannibal, Missouri actually had a sizable Jewish community. Um, Mark Twain wrote about it in his biography. He went to school with some Jewish boys. Um, he had some interesting things to say about them. Nothing bad, just interesting. But they never had a big enough community to have a congregation, not a problem. They would go across the river to Illinois. There was a congregation right there. But they did have their own cemetery, which was founded in 1860. Um, in 1906, there were 12 Jewish families, and in uh, 1916, uh, Rabbi Bloom of Springfield, Illinois, would travel on occasion to hold services and teach the children. So Kansas City has a long, good history, rich history of uh, Jewishness. The first congregation was formed. Now remember, St. Louis has the 1830s and Kansas City is 1870, which tells you how much later um, Jews arrived there. And there were 23 heads of families. Remember, only men get to do this right now who um, were, were the organizers. They held their first service in the Masonic Hall. Not unusual, so did people in Springfield and they had a rabbi. Um, rabbi Isaac Weiss, who's very well known in the reformed Jewish community in the United States, a leader, wrote that Kansas City, Missouri is one of the most progressive cities of the West. And it is pleasant that the same may be said of the Jews who reside there. Thank you very much. That's not sweet of him. Um, <laughs> after, after renting space, they built their first synagogue in 1875 when there were 60 members of the congregation, and you have to think that this is a big accomplishment to be able to raise the sum of money. Um, and in 1885, they had to build another one to expand and their new building sat 700 people and had basement classrooms. By 1887, there were now, along with um, congregation B'nai Judah, there were three Orthodox congregations. There were, there were enough to have four or five congregations at one time. St. Joseph, in 1859, 1859, before Kansas City, St. Joseph was more important. Seven men got together and founded Adat Joseph in St. Joseph. Two years later, the membership grew to 20, and the congregation bought a church and repurposed it. In 1862, there were 140 Jews in town. Again, I don't know if we're counting adults or men. I have a feeling it's men when I say that. Um, they had two Torahs. They had a cantor who was acting as the religious leader, so someone who could chant the service. And they also had a ritual slaughterer. So they had quite a large community. They were reform enough that for, for many Jews, because it is unknown when a holiday, Jewish holiday happens in Jerusalem, they will celebrate the holiday for two days to make sure they cover the Jerusalem day. But this community was very liberal and did away with the second day of the holiday, which is a big deal. It is a very big deal. Um, they hired um, Rabbi Isaac Schwab as their religious leader and he formed a choir. This is a very liberal community um, and had very large attendance. So, you know, I can't go without talking about Springfield. Gotta love my Springfield. Um, 1893, the congregation in Springfield was signed their articles of association for Temple Israel. They had been meeting for at least a decade in some form or another. This made it one of the 29 con Jewish congregations in the state by 1900. We go from one to 29 in 60 years. That's a huge jump. Um, they followed the re liberal German reform customs and did not have a rabbi at first. Jake Marx of uh, the Marx stores in town, was the religious leader for over 20 years. In um, 
1893, they had their first publicly announced religious service that was for Rosh Hashanah. And the service was held in South Street Christian Church, which is on the same grounds it was in 1893. It's just clearly a different building now. Um, I had the pleasure of giving a talk about German Jews in Springfield in that very building. It was very cool. So um, that's the South original South Street Christian Church building, which is not there now, but that's where they first worshiped. Um, but before that, um, this is Chickering Piano. It is now the Vandevort. Can you picture this in your head? And this is Papo's. And there is where they would worship upstairs. They rented space. And the kids would say, I've talked to some of the children who, who some of the now grown up children who went there. And they would say, their fathers would pray and they would sit against the back wall because the other side of the wall was the dance studio. So they could hear the piano. <laughs> Uh, Jefferson City. Um, the community still exists. It's always been a small community. They were found, their community um, was founded in 1883. Uh, and by 1900, there were only eight families left. One of which was Charles Zarlinski. He was the secretary and treasurer for quite a while of Bethel, and this building still stands and it is still the synagogue. I haven't been lucky enough to be there when someone's there so I can get inside, which I would love to do. If you have not had a chance yet to see the, con the building in Joplin, please go. In 1902, the B'nai B'rith and the Hebrew Ladies Aid Society, so B'nai B'rith is a men's fraternal organization, they were formed and they raised money for a synagogue and a cemetery. In 1904, Rabbi Emmanuel Kahn came from Arkansas and helped them get organized, uh, decide on what prayer books they were gonna use. And they met in a local hotel. When Rabbi Alter Abelson finally arrived in the community, he helped organize the United Hebrew Congregation they met at the Second Church of Christ, and they were not charter, chartered until 1914. So it took them quite a while. The city's population at that time was 175. In two years, the congregation size doubled, and they decided to build a building worthy of the Jewish citizens, one that will be an ornament to the city and be acceptable to all the citizens of this district, not merely to the particular worshipers. The cornerstone was laid in 1916, and it is a gorgeous example of architecture of the period. And the sanctuary has the most amazing acoustics. It is gorgeous. In, it is really beautiful inside. Um, the congregation is now down to about 20 families. So we have come to the end. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna plug Jews of Missouri. You can find a copy behind you. You can purchase as many as you like. <laughs> I'm gonna say, if you want to get Creating Community the Jews of Springfield, um, that's the website to go to to order it. It is available there. And I'm available for just about anything Jewish in the Ozarks. There we go. I did it. I, I did it on time. Um, and I am happy to answer questions. Are there questions on there? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Seeing other uh, religious uh, churches and everything, mm -hmm. but how were the Jews generally accepted in Missouri? Depends on the time period. So, um, pre-Civil War, there were so few, it, you know, at all times, there were so few Jews to not, it doesn't really make a difference if you consider that. Between 1840 and 1880, when you have this German wave, the Germans didn't care. 
if you were German, that's what was important. It didn't matter if you were Jewish or Catholic or um, Lutheran. And so there were German societies where the Germans would get together and they would speak German and eat Jewish, German food and do whatever it is that they wanted to do. And a lot of them were formed by the Jews. Um, so that period didn't have the problem that later periods have. Um, and even with the development of the KKK after the Civil War, they were, especially in this region, more concerned with unions and that kind of socialist stuff and people of color than they were the Jews. And in fact, there were a number of Jews in town who were asked to join the KKK. The Jews had to point out that we really can't do that. Let me explain to you why. Um, <laughs> And that did result in a few people leaving uh, the KKK. I can't say I'm heartbroken about that. Um, but I think anti-Semitism comes in waves. I can say in the last six, eight years, it's been worse than it has been before that. And um, some of the anti-Semitism is theologically based. That's my answer. Yeah. Hey. Okay, uh, Dr. Mara. <laughs> um, my family came from Russia in the late 1800s, early 1900s. From everything I've been told, they were very poor, uneducated people. They were tailors. Um, how did these people manage to get from Russia to the United States if they were so poor and uneducated? <laughs> poor and uneducated. Um, so you saved up your money. I know that's what my family did, right? They took every penny and they sent one person who would then work to send money back to bring the next person who would, and they would all work to bring the next person. There were also organizations that would sponsor people or sponsor families like Hyas Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. There were a number of these groups. <coughs> or what's interesting is these groups were founded because these, the Russian Jews would arrive and land in urban areas like New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Galveston, because I know Connie and I know her family came through Galveston, and they were overwhelming, right? There just wasn't the support network for these people. And so these aid societies would send people to towns where there was a need, where Jews in the town or other people in the town would say, we need A. And that's how people you may have heard of came to Springfield, like the Lotvin family some of you know the Lotvins. Um, so the patriarch was, came through Galveston, which he didn't mean to, but that he thought he was going to New York to meet his brother, but that didn't happen. And he was a cobbler. And there was a man in town who needed a partner, uh, uh, someone to work in his shoe business. So a tag was put on his neck and he was put on a train and sent to Springfield, Missouri, where he was met and settled. Um, and that's kind of how it all happened in the Midwest anyway. So Jews were, were sent away by other Jews who felt they were being helpful. Not all the Jews who went to small towns um, did well in them because they were alone and they didn't speak the language and they may not have had the skill, um, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> So uh, when you started your talk, you pointed out that uh, New Madrid was where the first Jewish settler was. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a community there any longer? No. I didn't think, I didn't no. think so. I'm from that area of Missouri, and I was like, I, I was fascinated to learn about the history. The history. He's in the census, and he's actually listed as a German Jew in the census, which is kind of unusual. The census of 1880 or, I mean, 1780 or whatever, there was the first census. Um, but... Uh, it was that sprinkling of people. So really, the communities that existed, that created 
congregations were St. Louis, Jeff City, Kansas City, Springfield, those. The community in New Madrid was two, three people. Yeah. So no, they, I mean, they were there. I like to point out they were there because everybody should recognize that they were there, but they didn't, they didn't stay or prosper or he went off and lived with one of his children. The, the Block family was from uh, Czechoslovakia and came to Virginia and the father had two wives and numerous, numerous children, um, all of whom had numerous children, <laughs> which is why there is some intermarriage between cousins. Um, so that's why they are so prolific. So they would go to one town and then go, I don't want to live here and go move to another town. Right. Woo. As far as I know, they did. Any other questions? I feel like it's class questions, problems, concerns yeah. that we can address today. Okay. Well, yes, we have, we have books in the back. Rachel, I'll let you say a few words to close out. I was just going to thank you, Mara. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving this talk and sharing this um, important part of me. history. Thank you for publishing my book. We're, we're, we're glad to be able to do things like this. Um, please take advantage of Mara being here to sign her books in the back. As she said, they're available. Please uh, take advantage of that. And thank you all for coming today.